Hello and welcome to In the Making, a series of conversations from North Bennett Street School where we connect with a range of new voices, fields, and perspectives. Before we get into our conversation, we want to thank the many supporters that make our programs possible, including the Massachusetts Cultural Council, the Holt and Bugby Company, and all of our corporate partners in craft. My name is Kristen Odell. I'm an NBSS staff member and host of In the Making. Today we are speaking with Luke and Allison Johansson, founders of the Sloyd Experience in Louisville, Colorado, spelled like Louisville, but it's Louisville. <laughs> Using Sloyd principles of learning, they have been changing the ways in which their young community members learn. Welcome to NBSS, Luke and Allison. Thank you so much. We're excited. Yes, thanks for being here. Um, let's just start with the fundamentals of this. How did how was Sloyd Experience born? Tell us how it all began. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Kristen. So Sloyd itself has been around for about 150 plus years. Uh, it originated in Scandinavia, but Sloyd Experience, the organization that Allison and I founded, uh, has only been around for about five years. So we had never heard the word Sloyd before. Mm -hmm. And we were on a February night about five years ago, scrolling through our Apple TV, going to our favorite app, which is PBS. And we found the Woodwrights shop, which used to be on from time to time in my household growing up. And there was an episode entitled, Who Wrote the Book of Sloyd? And Roy Underhill, the host, he talked about a series of books, and then he held up this one, which is the Teacher's Handbook of Sloyd. And he went on to talk about the philosophy of what Sloyd, educational Sloyd, was as it was developed in the mid to late 1800s. And the importance of using woodworking merely as a means of cultivating character in children being intentional and giving opportunity to practice concentration, develop self-reliance, instill the value of neatness and accuracy. And I'll never forget us watching that episode and literally looking at each other and thinking, wow, it was. we need this today. Yeah, we had two young sons at this point. We had an almost like two or three year old and a, a newborn baby. And as try as these new parents trying to find their way in this like parenting realm, and how are we going to be really purposeful in raising them to become good good humans and fantastic adults someday? Um, this it made a lot of sense. Uh, Luke and I grew up in the Midwest and in agriculture backgrounds where there was a lot of hands on work and responsibility and. In our new home and our new community, we are in town, uh, which is fantastic. There's a lot of, you know, there's pros and cons to each, but some of the things that we, that really resonated with us growing up, we didn't have access to anymore. And how mm -hmm. we're going to accomplish some of those things with our kids, it was kind of an aha moment with what this was and having been kind of hands-on people our whole life yeah. it made, made sense. And, and furthermore, not just the difference between rural and suburban living, the changes that we all are experiencing with technology. Yeah. Yep. And it's becoming so pervasive in all of our communities and all of our individual lives. And yeah. and who knows what the next hundred years is going to look like, right? But but we wanted to try to be intentional, not just for our own two boys, even though they were a large part of the calculus at the beginning of this, but how can we make a difference in the lives of yeah all children, right? In our community and, and beyond. Yes. So, go ahead. Was so you you grew up in on farm in in sort of farm farmer farming environments. Was that not an option that you wanted to entertain? Uh well so as we were talking before the episode started, we, we were both uh, active duty military. Mm -hmm. And so we moved around the country for about 10 years and my last assignment landed us here in Colorado and it felt yeah. right as a yeah. place to kind of start planting some roots. So yeah. um, I, I love the idea of, of being out on a farm um, in rural environments. I, I, I love it. Right. Yeah. But I, for us, as we were starting a new family, 
um, where we landed felt like a good place. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's where we decided to plant and yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I only ask that because you have so you have extensive years of your history spent in the farming community and that and and maybe subconsciously that wasn't the direction you wanted to go in because that's a whole other problematic sure. area of our culture and society. And in woodworking, you know, there's so much potential for creation, creative act, you know, yeah. 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 That's so we ended up deciding to make take this idea and put it into action. We had been, spent a bunch of time brainstorming and we were able to build up um, a series of small benches. We learned all we could about the, the curriculum and we, we knew nothing about traditional woodworking when we started. Like, And you can bold and underline and italicize nothing. Nothing. <laughs> What gave you the bravery then? Was it just you saw this special about this method of learning and yeah. you're just like, this is what our kids need, period. Yeah. Yeah. The the hands-on, authentic, real experience of doing. Yeah. And you can bold italicize and underline doing there. I think that's kind of a core belief of both Allison and I and something that we're trying to infuse in Sloyd experience and something that Otto Solomon believed wholeheartedly as well. And I, I think that our, our posterity, our, our children, our future generations, they need more opportunity because they're so capable of doing. We, they just, they need opportunity and mm -hmm. encouragement to do so. Um, Luke, since you just held that up and we just have this question right here, repeat the name of the book again, since you just had it. Yeah, it's called The Teacher's Handbook of Sloyd. It's written by Otto Solomon. By Otto Solomon. And Thank you. That, that's an original copy. There are some other recent publications mm -hmm. that, that are the original text, um, but you can find those. Online, yeah. So when um, you kind of answered this question, had either of you been introduced to Sloyd in your upbringing, you hadn't even had been introduced to woodworking, even though you have an en engineering background, Luke. Sure. Um, I guess that doesn't translate. It must translate a little bit to bench work. Well, I think that the only translation there may be the fact that with engineering, you develop some degree of spatial intelligence, right? But even as a designer in the engineering world, it's not hands-on, right? You're not the hands-on person that's mm -hmm. in there doing something so but that interest has always been there. that interest has, has always been a part of me however and I've, I've usually expressed that in various hobbies along the way I, I I will never forget when I was a kid I found an old uh western push saw that was probably like a distant or something and I tried using it on an old, an old bench and um because I thought it was cool but the teeth I'm sure were not sharp and the saw was not straight. And I experienced a degree of frustration that really kind of prevented me from even thinking that, oh, mm -hmm. maybe I should keep going along with this, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's relevant because one of the most important parts for us as instructors, as educators in this classroom is making sure that we're equipping the children with properly tuned tools, mm -hmm. right? We are trying to improve and increase their frustration tolerance, but they shouldn't experience frustration from a dull plane, a yes. dull blade, yes. a fully workbench, right? They should experience frustration from, I've never done this before and I'm trying to figure it out, mm -hmm. right? And then we can encourage that. So let's go back to those beginnings. So you set out to do this for the sake of your, your kids and your community. So what were some of the first steps? And let's get into missteps, like be honest. Yeah. Oh, sure. There were a lot of missteps. Um, we, so we incorporated as a nonprofit and we like, we have to get students. We have to put this into practice. Um, we set up under a shade tree at our local park and we hauled benches in and out of Luke's work truck and we set them up and Took them down every day and we did this for several weeks um right before covid mm -hmm. had started like had happened and you know up up ended everything but we had these kids that weren't ours we had practiced this with our children at you know by the time that we kicked everything off and then all of a sudden 
there were kids at these benches and they were having the time of their life and they were struggling and there was big emotions and there was pride and there was celebration. And then that just kind of fueled the fire more and more parents. We weren't having to convince anyone anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, Hey, like, just give it a try. Like you can have it for free to start or, or that it, it was one of those, this made sense. People were curious. The kids were enjoying themselves. So we started fundraising and we ended up making some career changes. At that point, Luke had taken a leave of absence from uh, an engineering job that he had. And we were like, no, this deserves more time and energy. We can't do this in the way that it needs to be done. Um, and over the course of that kind of trial program, we um, were able to line up with two teachers at our local elementary school who had actually gone to Finland. They had seen real life Sloyd and craft education um, that's still compulsory today in most of the Scandinavian schools. And because of the small community um, that we have and the connection, the connections that there are, we had a, a neighbor that was like, what you guys are doing sounds like what these teachers had talked about and that they mm. raised after they came back from Finland. And we were able to, to connect and meet. And essentially the conversations were, how do we get this program in our classroom? And over the course of two years of working and planning and growing our after school program and continuing along those lines, we wound up in a public school in Louisville. So we've grown from under a tree to a, a program that supports 165 kids during the, the school day. And this year we had, I think it was 396 total kiddos um, wow. in our summer and after school programming and our in-school programming. And, and ages? Uh, we, they're range from ages six to about 14 and 15. Mm -hmm. so in school, we have the second and fifth graders, but our after school program, um, it's a mixed age range. So like when we have our after school program today, we have six-year-olds through 13-year-olds that'll be here today. And can you tell me the format initially, like step one, when you did get into the school, was it just a few hours every day or, you know, a few hours on front, you know, what was the format? For the in-school programming? Yeah. Um, all of the second graders get one hour per week for the duration of the entire academic year. So, and it's all individual instruction, which is also one of the kind of principles of of original Sloyd, that it's not classroom instruction. It's not me standing up and saying, okay, class, today we're going to learn cross cuts. Every student is at his or her own pace. And that's one of the things that makes it so valuable and so interesting and so relevant to every, every student, right? It meets mm -hmm. his or her needs at that time right? To where yes. they're not either bored or so frustrated that they just give up. Um, so yeah, it's like, essentially it's a special. So like music art or PE. So they come in for an hour a week throughout the entire academic year. The fifth grade, their class is a little bit bigger. So they get, they alternate, they get slowed every other week um, for that same like hour, hour window. But our classroom, we do eight to 10 students at a time. It's a, a small group. Um, mm -hmm. And can you tell, um, I, I don't know if you can put your finger on this with your kids being so young, but when you sort of tested the tested some of these ideas out on your kids when they were younger, did you see, um, did you discover some immediate result or some, you know, did something just happen in them that, that assured you that, okay, we're on the right path here? I don't know that anything in this is immediate. I think that it's all intentional, however. And there are, without a doubt, changes that you notice over time in their demeanor, in their character, in their understanding and accept personal acceptance of responsibility, mistakes. responsibility and mistakes mm -hmm. and, um, and emotional regulation. I think that that is one of the one of the big things that we're trying to do through Sloyd, through a real experience, right? I mean, it, that that has meaning, it has purpose. Not, not meaning and purpose that I instilled upon them, but they come to their bench and they want to do their best, right? And when things don't go quite right, without a doubt, 
it evokes emotion. Or if things go great, it evokes emotion. Regardless, that that extreme of emotion in which they're feeling is really what starts to shape their character. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, like growth mindset, that's become a, a huge piece of education um, and something that we were not intimately like familiar with until we like dove into Sloyd. Um, as you like learn and like how people learn and how to have that that growth mindset, there's a lot of really great research on there. And it's essentially, I'm not good yet. Like having that ability to move forward and know that you can get better. But we know through hard work and through, determination. Exactly. But practicing it has become the piece that researchers, um, Carol Dweck, um, Huberman, Adam Grant, some of these, um, all these different scientists that they they talk about. And one of the ways of like actually accomplishing and capitalizing on a growth mindset is being able to practice it. Well, you can practice it in a Sloyd classroom where it's a little bit different um, and it develops a whole person and not just an academic test score. Mm -hmm. So where you can have that celebrated growth and that feeling of accomplishment and pride and the things that you've done. Like I used to get really mad every time I mismeasured. Well, I don't get so mad anymore. And oh, I don't even mismeasure as much anymore because I'm taking the time. Like there's, there's so many things that can be learned. And when you're just having the opportunity for that repetition, you can have the opportunity for that growth mindset and then that neuroplasticity that that happens mm. to shape kids at such a young age during their formative years right and that's why we're working with kids in that younger age range we're not I mean, sloyd you could do sloyd as an adult you could do educational sloyd as an adult or a high schooler but we can shape so much more within absolutely how someone functions as an adult um, when you start so much earlier, not only shaping young minds in healthy ways, but creating more artisans and makers in the world, which is what we yeah. need more of. Yeah, without a doubt. The however for us, though, is that we view that as purely incidental, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I, I want there to be more makers and more creators in the world, just like you, right? But our our primary aim is the cultivation of character in children. Absolutely. We say it's it's one thing to say that mistakes are okay or great for learning, but it's another to feel it. It's an, it's another thing to feel it. And I think it's so important that children get that opportunity to, to learn that it's okay and that it's great. If I could, I think this is a good opportunity to kind of pan over to a part of our classroom here that we call the wall of learning. Can you see it over there? Mm -hmm. All those pieces of wood hanging. So we started the wall of learning with me hanging up a bunch of my own woodworking mistakes. And there's no shortage. <laughs> and it's, it's um, become an open invitation to the students. When they make a mistake on something, they cut it too short, they plan it too narrow, something isn't quite square, something split, something chipped, whatever, you know? You can hang it up on the wall of learning with me. You don't have to, but if you want to, you may. Mm -hmm. and the vast majority choose to hang it up. And it not becomes, always initially. Not initially. So I, I would now, so like as we're, ha we're halfway into the school year, so I would say that the majority of kids are like ready, like they'll walk their mistake up, they'll put it in the bin and they'll go get their own new piece of wood. But initially that, that mistake, it, I mean, there's, there's tears, there's like hiding that it happened, like trying to like, not let anyone know or see, let us see, you know, just complete denial that it was there. And the last thing they want to do is put it on display. Right. The last thing that you want to share is that like failure, but it's become just such a, like, like they embrace it. It's mm -hmm. a, like they'll write their name on it. They'll put a smiley face on that piece of wood and they're, they're somewhat proud of it. And they talk to their parents about it and their parents are like, they, they understand that these mistakes are actually okay. And it has, I love that incorporating, like saying, t speaking about failure more frequently, it's just, it's, it is equally part of life. Um, I just, I love that. That's great. And what a shift in mindset that would be. What, yeah. what, a, what a change in society we would have if everybody truly embraced that to their core. Oh, the grace that it brings, right? The grace and the grit simultaneously, mm. right? you know? Uh, um, and I, 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 we really believe that you can 
only learn that through true authentic experiences in reality mm -hmm. as opposed to yeah there's virtual there's a, a lot of reality. things that technology can do but that that hands-on experience is something that is starting to become fleeting so having yeah. that opportunity well that's here. why we still exist in this capacity i mean we've it Sloyd, the Sloyd method was introduced at North Bennett Street Industrial School in 1890. Mm -hmm. And we still use the same principles in this, these programs here. And I want to ask you, I know we're talking about building, um, uh, cultivating character in young people, getting, getting this education model into the young people's lives, but you two briefly as adults, what's something you mentioned, you know, um, being more kind to yourself about mismeasuring or not m mismeasuring less, what's something that you two as adults have learned about yourselves through starting Sloyd experience? I'll, I will start. So you also see some of these signs behind us. Those are our primary aims. Resilience, concentration, self-reliance, love for labor, neatness, as we, as the managers of this organization that we've started, we've realized that we need so desperately to exhibit those character traits in some of the troubles that we're navigating just to kind of continue our operations, right? Perseverance is so, so important because nothing is easy. There's nothing easy about starting and maintaining and trying to spread what we're doing, right? There are there are forces in this world that don't yep. want that to happen. Which, I mean, that's why it's not, there's not a current Sloyd school still at North Bennett. Like there were forces within the fact that it wasn't economically sustainable anymore mm -hmm. that kind of pushed it away. And our our goal is to to bring it back and so it doesn't leave again because there's mm -hmm. so so much value in what once was here i mean it was at north Bennett, and we, there's so many resources that we've taken from like what was there yeah what um well, let me ask you a question about sort of public school systems um you know i went to a public school in central florida many public schools had i i don't know how many still do but um you know, home ec, shop classes where you are just going in and doing shop work. Um, what would you say is the, what does Sloyd method and Sloyd experience provide that one of those sort of elective classes in a public school? If you can answer that, what, what do you think it is? I think it starts with why. And to take from the title of Start With Why, the book from Simon Sinek, right? Um, our why is based upon the inherent needs of a child. It's based upon character development. In teaching and practicing concentration, attention, getting them to realize the power that is within themselves. Um, as opposed to something that is more based upon the needs of the economy. Mm -hmm. and for the majority of the time that shop class or home ec or any of the technical education courses have been in school, a lot of the why is based upon the economy. And that's why shop class has been disappearing from so many different schools, right? The other thing too is simply the age, right? A lot of those types of classes might be late middle school and high school. High school, yeah. Right, right. And um, whereas this is without a doubt elementary and intentionally during the formative years of a child's life. When, and so yes, I get that's that, thank you for, for, for painting it that way what and I know that the the aim of Sloyd experience and what you two are doing is um it's about character do you have a do you have that written somewhere in your mind or in the back of your mind of what 
what do you do if one of these young people then it's like, I'm going to become a furniture maker and how do you navigate, you know, I support it and encourage it and like yeah. let them feel all of those feelings. And it, it's a hundred percent supported. Like this brings us joy and your career should bring you joy. Oh yes. And being able to kind of normalize where there's no stigma behind um, anything where you are just as capable and talented as a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher or an accountant or a garbage man or a woodworker or a plumber, like where there's no stigma behind that. And I think that being able to be exposed to some of those trades and some of those um, experiences where you are working with your hands at an early age, um, that, that, that then no one is frowning. I'm not going to frown upon it. Um, there might be, uh, you know, but where other students and their peers, they can all grow up um, respecting the hard work that goes in to the, the manual labor, the study of the skill that you have to get good at, whether it is an organic chemistry equation or the, the complexities behind, you know, fine furniture mm -hmm. making. Well, I mean, we do, there, there is financial viability in so many trades right now. I mean, carpentry blown up. Um, we teach locksmithing here. There's stable mm -hmm. stability in, in that career. Um, machinists are hard to come by right now um, in this region. High paying jobs are in machinists. But I guess I'm just trying to, I'm, I'm just wondering how, um, and you don't, there, it doesn't have to be separated. There, there doesn't need to be a separation, but the, that Sloyd experience and what Sloyd was here at North Bennett at one point it is just about cultivating character, but it can also create viable careers in young people. Right. It creates so much opportunity. Yeah. yeah. So uh, like I said before, um, I, I think that that is one of the things that could be very incidental to what we're doing here. Um, and I think that we've made ourselves pretty clear that Sloyd is not a track for the trades. However, if at a young age we're giving kids an opportunity to work with their hands and work with tools and they find joy and satisfaction in that once they get to later stages in their life and there's an opportunity that is presented to them and they think back on Sloyd and, and they think well I enjoyed that right and then they don't go into it with any sort of bias or uh, preconceived notions that they may be getting from the rest of society to say, you you need to go into a knowledge job, a knowledge mm -hmm. field. You need to be white collar, pure, right? Then there, I, I think that there's more opportunity to support that. I, I think that they go hand in hand, but they're two separate hands. <laughs> yes, I hear you. <laughs> Um, I just, I'm going to note two things that, that are so relevant to what you're doing and, um, just reinforce the importance of what you're doing. Um, one is a talk I had recently with a person who wrote the book called thinking with things, um, Sarah Kuhn, yes. and she talked at length about the classroom that we all know of. That's basically a deprivation chamber, you know? a yes. seat, a chair, a teacher, a de like that's it, you know, not, nothing, not nothing to play with. And um, so just fascinating, you know, studies there on how that's affected brain growth in our youth, ADHD, um, ter ADHD turned, you know, uh, bringing on the influx of medication for ADHD. Um, so again, reinforcing what you're doing there. And then also a new study, you raised your phone earlier, a new study that was just put out um, by the Program for International Student Assessment found a link between phone usage and declining academic performance. And there's, and I'll just quote, I'll say this quote because it's so powerful. We have discovered that by injecting classrooms with phones, we have seen a dramatic increase in this sort of negative relationship between device use and life satisfaction, happiness, and a decline in achievement. Um, so that speaks volumes to how important this work is. There's a, another study that you found 
fairly recently from, from I think it was a Finnish study where they linked dexterity and fine motor skills to improved cognition. So uh, there's there's another perspective. There's so much science out there backing oh, sure. this type of education. And from a, a not necessarily scientific point of view, um, one of the thing that's, things that has been so neat in all of this, so we would work as a family. I mean, as this has been a family endeavor, as we've, we've grown and built and refined what we're doing, it's really special when families are coming to us, well, how do we get started in doing this at home? And we have the number of Christmas gift lists that we help share, like as like in these last two years where students want to do this at home and they're doing it with their dads and they're doing it with their grandfathers and the ability to not lose this craft and not that it's that's a hundred percent disappearing, but the idea that we can help it grow and mm -hmm. like have it at such a young age where then they're, they're doing it with their families and oh, then they're not on that technology at home in the same way that maybe they might have been. But yeah, where we're, it's really exciting to see some of these kids going home to do these things, yeah. even when they're not in our classroom. Yep. The, the word enthusiasm comes to mind, right? We want kids to be enthusiastic. We want kids to be enthusiastic about school, to be enthusiastic about learning. And it's so sad when there are kids that aren't, right? And I, I go back to that vision that you painted, Kristen, of of this sterile classroom with- Deprivation just, chamber. <laughs> yes, exactly, right? Who would be enthusiastic about that, yeah. right? But uh, kids come into this classroom with a smile on their face and we get to celebrate that, but also remind them, you're not coming in here just to do easy things you're coming on in here with a challenge in front of you but you still have a smile on your face mm -hmm. and there, there's inspiration all around them in, in what what they're looking at the things that are made from wood the tools that are around there's so many questions inspiring curiosity the list goes on and and that joy as an instructor we get to, yeah. to live day in well, and day ju just let's pause on that alone i mean the 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 tactile piece of this for kids' brains, you know, I think of, okay, I think of the deprivation chamber and how, um, I and I think how that, that led into fidget spinners and you think of plastic and silicone that those are made of. Mm -hmm. And you think of these spaces and it's all wood and natural material. And even that just psychologically is is huge for a young person, I think. It is, the, the plain shavings that these, mm -hmm children are able to, to make and then they'll save their their favorite one and they'll notice the different thicknesses and like the, they become treasures and the number of them that say this is satisfying when they push a plane across a piece of wood like just the the act of that doing and then they have this piece of like nature that then they're like touching and then we talk about how how the tree grew and I mean there's so many different ways that you can connect and make just a very real environment for them and it's so organic too yeah um what does it mean that the teaching should be interesting in character that kind of goes along with what um allison was just talking about there right th th there's kind of a, a magic to woodworking in and of itself the first time that these students push a plane across an edge of a piece of wood it's like it's beyond interesting they've, they've like never seen anything yeah. and they can't it's hard for them to even grasp that that curl is in fact wood mm. right and they're they're blown away the that quote from um how people learn is, yeah. is really good there, there there's a book called how people learn and here's the quote emotional processing steers behavior thought and learning Quite literally, it is neurologically impossible for someone to think deeply or remember information they have had no emotion about because a healthy brain does not waste energy processing information that, that does not matter to the individual. Mm -hmm. And so things matter to the individuals. Things matter to the students that come in here because it, it's naturally interesting, naturally compelling, and naturally they want to attend and focus on what's going on in front of them. Um, and one of the things that I've been 
pondering lately because this happens to me in my own projects. The, the learning and the thinking doesn't stop as soon as I leave the shop. I'm thinking about my project even at night, right? I'm thinking about how these pieces are going to fit together or not fit together. I'm thinking about what side of the line I cut on or didn't cut on, right? And and that learning and processing is taking place. And that is true of the students too. Yeah. When they leave the classroom, they're, they're, they're still thinking about it because- And they'll stop you in the hallway to tell you about it and- Because it's they're emotionally engaged yeah. with the project and the yeah. process. And this touches on something else in, in sort of the bulleted list of, of qualify, qualifiers for Sloyd. Um, the instruction should be intuitive in its character. And to me, that is referencing what you're talking about, that it's it's what we know as the hand head, ha hand head heart connection. Sure, and yes. if you're thinking of your, you know, sawing your dovetails at night, you're, you're, you, you're remembering that dove, that, um, that the feel of the saw in the wood. And I compare that to like a kid's memory of swiping their phone. There's nothing on the other end. Mm. Absolutely. Nothing. There's no product coming from that. You know, mm. it's. Um, I have a few comments that I want to throw at you from our guests. Um, and one from an NBSS alum who says, I think this is such a wonderful enterprise and opportunity. What are your plans to expand and how can parents help support this in their own communities? Great question. So as we went on our own journey here, we've really discovered that there are very few, if any, individuals that dispute why this is important and relevant. However, almost nobody knows how. Nobody knows how to go about implementing a classroom like this, a model series like this, a framework. Or they how don't... to convince a school that this is important. Hmm. How to That's a big that's... piece. Yeah. So it right now, that's kind of where we're we're headed. Yeah. And we're working on developing, well, we've developed a, a model series. And we're working on publishing that along with a very detailed narrative on not just the technical side of what tools should be used and how to use and how to maintain and when to introduce them, but also some of the common uh, emotional responses that children may give as they go along these model series or common mistakes that they will make that you as an educator can look for and give guidance to. And one of the, the key attributes of, of Sloyd education is as an educator, knowing how to say just the right amount, just enough, mm -hmm. but not too much, right? I don't want to give all of the answers away because I want to give you as a student the opportunity to develop your own intuition and self-reliance, but I don't want you to get into a place where you're struggling so severely that you're going to um, just be completely repelled by the idea of, of wanting to continue with this, right? So that tact, that balance is very individual in nature, hence the need for individual instruction as well. Um, but in that narrative on the models, trying to give more clarity to what that looks like. Because when we were starting all of this, you read through this book and you have a lot of question marks still, right? The philosophy is all there. The philosophy is jaw dropping. It's inspiring. It's motivating. But you might ponder, if, especially if you're anything like Allison or I, who have little to no woodworking experience, and you say, how do I go about that? Right. So what we want to answer those questions. That's the, the next step. So over the last five years, we've refined the curriculum. So we use Gustav Larson's um, Elementary Sloyd and Whittling to be the basis of our initial curriculum. And as we've put that together, we're continuing to refine and expand that. Um, but to share that, like not to hold those things like as they're this private enterprise that only Sloyd experience should have. So what we've started doing, we've had several individuals and organizations reach out to us and we've 
piloted and trained instructors in three other locations and kind of just like, can we replicate this? Can we share what we've learned to, to grow so that this can not only be in Louisville, Colorado, that it can be in Davenport, Iowa, or this town in California. So we've, we've piloted that. And at this point we're, we're starting to be like, okay, it's possible. So the development of a formal training opportunity where we can bring others in or how do we share those resources, um, but still be able to continue to grow what we're doing and like bettering it so that we can stay true to our mission and serve more youth. So we're ironing, ironing out some of, some of those things. So does that kind of answer yeah, and I'm going to say uh, someone just joined late and is sort of asking this very question. So to Lee, who just typed the question, um, they're kind of answering that now that you're there's modifications. You're you're using the basic framework, but and there have to be modifications because you're dealing with a completely different generation of children that have a whole other host of external noise. Mm-hmm. So. so- Here's a quick um, response to that very topic. In original Swedish, Sloyd, the first tool that they started with was the knife. And their justification was that every student already has vast experience with the knife at home. Which is not true, not not the case for our kids. 90% 90 of the kids that we teach to whittle, which happens to be on our, I think, fourth model now, um, you'll ask them like, so like, do you, you know, you kind of want to know like what their experience is with the tool. I would say 90% of them have never Ever. even cut a cucumber in the kitchen by right. the age of eight years old. So we, we delay that. It's not the first tool that they're using anymore. However, it's not something that we're not going to introduce like right. the focus that you can get out of a, a youth using a knife. I mean, when you talk about like these different learners and uh, you mentioned the term ADHD before, like the ability that you can, the focus and concentration that you can instill um, by working at a bench, by using your hands where it's not a pencil to paper rote memorization, um, you can overcome some of those perceived problems, but then teach that concentration for students where it's harder in a traditional classroom. And the teachers are seeing it carry over like into the academic area. And we're not trying to just make academics better. The idea is that this spills over into everything. This spills right. into friendships and family relationships. It spills over into just me- mental health. It spills over into the, your academic performance. And mm-hmm. they're actually seeing that as the case for this variety of learners, the high academic achievers that where school comes naturally easy and those where school isn't a place that they find to be joyful yeah. um, and that the the math isn't fun. Yeah, right. We- certainly don't view ourselves as the solution, but we view ourselves as part of the solution to some of these problems that we're talking about culturally. Mm -hmm. And I think that it would behoove us all if we took a much more proactive response as opposed to reactive to these problems. And I think that Sloyd education is a great example of being proactive. Yes. I'm going to jump into some other questions because we're getting close to the top here. Um, physical labor is the means through which you are teaching character. Are you explicit about that with your students or is the focus entirely on the work and kids may or may not recognize the larger lessons? I would say that we are very, very explicit at a minimum with the idea that mistakes are the gateway to learning. We talk about mistakes a lot in the classroom because they happen. And and when I showed you the wall of learning, a lot of times if a student is struggling emotionally with a mistake that has happened, I will try my best to empathize with them by pulling a physical representation of one of my own mistakes as an adult, as a woodworker to say, look, some, something went wrong. And I, I was frustrated with it, but learning how to look at it in a positive light, right? That this isn't failure. This is opportunity to learn and grow. Um, it, it's helpful. But how can you 
Activity after school activity announcement. Oh, that's your bell. That's us. <laughs> ah, school's beginning, everybody. It's ending. It's ending. It's yeah. ending. Sorry, it's ending. Yes. Um, but how would you? So you're you're speaking specifically to mistakes, but um, I, I believe the question was more about labor, and mm -hmm. I guess the two you can put the two neck and neck there. We, we talk a lot about the value of working yep. hard it's as well. It's about hard work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's really interesting too, when the students are using the tool, they're using the plane for the first time. They look at their hands, they're like, my hands are red, right? They're pumping full of blood. So we don't necessarily like talk about how like that. They're the ones realizing it. They're the ones taking off their jacket. They're the ones you know, noticing like, I have a blister from like X, Y, or Z, or they are seeing and then inherently developing a respect for that labor. Um, so it's I not think that's, yeah, I think that's the answer to the question that you're not yeah. being explicit about it, but you are confident that that message is that's it's absolutely being, yeah. we had a, a fifth grader um, that very clearly said, like, he didn't have a respect for hard work before it, it he verbalized this makes me respect hard work like that. They didn't understand it. And, but it's not like, okay, well now you're going to work hard. Now you're going to have to do this and it's going to right. be challenging. They, they see that right away. You know, yes. when they have to set their saw on the tool rack and, and take a break because like, no joke, that rip cut is um, half of their height. And it takes a lot of energy to accomplish that when you're six years old. So. Um, let's talk about progression of projects that you teach. What are you starting with? And are you using the classic Sloyd projects generally? So we are using some of the classic projects from Gustav Larsson's elementary Sloyd and Whittling. And the first project in his book was the pencil sharpener, which is a block of wood that they have to cut to length and plane to width. And then they glue a piece of sandpaper on there. And then they can use that sandpaper to sharpen the graphite on their pencil so and simple and so necessary and yes the, like we didn't think that some of that would like be relevant today like we questioned that originally um but is it going to be interesting yeah like students, are these kids right? going to think this is neat and cool turns out they do I, like there are some that bring their own pencil sharpener with them to school or to sloyd um but yeah we we've added to the original model series to kind of inject some different ways to introduce different tools and skills, but we're using the historical methods and the, the historical tools. I mean, the majority of the tools in our classroom are antique. We have um, some new low angle block planes. We're using Japanese pole saws as the introductory saw to then later introduce Western saws and, and those things. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's a historical curriculum that we're expanding and refining so that it makes sense. We had to rewrite all of it because the language didn't make sense of and course. our kids don't have knives that they're using regularly they're not measuring the same that they used to so how to make it applicable and understandable today mm -hmm. and you have something in your hand luke are you is that something oh. else that you're learning yeah. to make this, a, model? this is an example of the opposite end of the model series of something that's much more complex that students are capable of making i mean this this little toy windmill uh, it has a half lap joint. They're using their knife to kind of chamfer the, out the uh, blades for the windmill. The mast is tapered on three sides. It's a complex project. And again, uh, I mean, we weren't explicitly clear in this, but this is purely traditional woodworking, all hand tools, no power tools, and, and students can do that. I, That's I think, the kind of fidget spinner that we need. Exactly. Exactly. Have you been in contact with some of the Scandinavian Sloyd teaching academies? Yes, we have. Um, we, when we originally started, we found a professor of Sloyd, which there are such things in Scandinavia because they're st still studying the um, all of the benefits associated with Sloyd education. And uh, coinciden coincidentally enough, her name was Dr. Johansson. And so it's our same last name. She taught mm -hmm. at the uh, Gothenburg, Gothenburg. Mm -hmm. um, there's a Finnish um, PhD professor that has found the work that we're doing. So it's been an interesting, interesting conversations because it's so like we're trying to learn from them, but they're so far into it where it's so compulsory. It's so a part of their education and like this, the system it's, 
been that way since the late 1800s. So it's some of the questions that we ask and like our, our methods and how we're going about things. It's just hard to communicate because we're so far removed. Like we're starting from scratch when yep. they've been in it for so long. When it's like their culture, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but the feedback has been great. They've been exceptionally helpful and like it, to have cheerleaders from across the ocean that are like, thank you for doing this and taking it on and like giving like those yeah this is what you should be doing or that that's the right tool or you're on the right track with your curriculum it's yeah. been have those dynamics that calls. must be so reinforcing also to j- just to have to have that feedback but to know that they are doing this they've been doing it for so many years and they're still enthusiastic about it i mean that that instills a lot of excitement how are you teaching safety um how do you present safe practice of using a knife Okay, so I'll I'll just start with safety overall. When we have a new learner that comes into the classroom for the very first time, um, we go over a set of safety protocol and some of the most important, like the first two rules. Number one, if you have your work held in the vice and number two, you have two hands on the tool. If you can effectively instill that in a new learner and enforce it throughout you're going to have a pretty safe classroom everything is individual instruction so when they are introduced to the saw for the first time or the plane for the first time or the knife you're demonstrating how it's used where not to touch like this is a face-to-face conversation with each student um where it's it's not like they have to read um, and we may supplement with like, here is a written book that you need, but but we again, start with like six-year-olds. Um, so that literacy piece is important and not always there, but that individual instruction, it's a one-on-one lesson. So as I'm teaching a child to whittle for the first time, I'm demonstrating, I'm telling them how to take it out of the sheath, how to put it back in. And then you know where your highest risk is in the classroom and you you keep your eye on that. Your back is never turned to it, but teaching that respect from like a very early on and knowing that there is risk, teaching the students that there is risk is how we introduce how to be safe. Mm -hmm. With the knife in particular, these are the knives that we use in the classroom Mm. and see that it does not come to a deck point at all, but they're just learning the whittling stroke. So along with all of the standard safety protocols, whittling away from your, we only do away from your body. Mm -hmm. Um, And, and the other thing from a safety perspective is that the instructor has to always know where his or her highest risk in the classroom is and make sure that you're devoting requisite attention to that individual. So whether that's a student themselves or a new exercise or a new tool, um, the majority of the cuts that we get in the classroom are from edges of wood themselves, like not tools. Because they've planed it and they've planed it so flat and that edge is sharp. Yeah. Over five years, band-aids are all that we've luckily had to had to use for relative, I mean, minor, minor injuries. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But these kids are capable. Yeah. I mean, if you build in respect for a sharp object, that's that's something that you always have. You're teaching that young. And and risk management. I mean, this is a whole nother thing that I could go on to talk about for a long time. I know that we don't have that much time, but if we're able to instill an appreciation for risk and subsequently how to manage it in a young person, when they get to the later stages of their lives, they'll be able to better recognize risk when it presents itself and then how to respond to it and, and have appreciation for it. That, mm-hmm have an appreciation for the reality of what- The consequences of your actions. Right. Are you gathering from a bookbinding alum from North Bennett Street, are you gathering any academic outcome data that you can use to compare student success before and after your program? Um, And if so, should this person would like to be involved? (laughs) Uh, So it's challenging to gather um, in, there's a lot of, uh, in research studies and, how to gather data from youth. Um, What we've done is we've surveyed um, parents. Um, We have a survey that was designed by um, a researcher out of the University of Northern Iowa, the Regent Center for Early Education and Development. Development. So one of the ways that we're gathering data is through the survey of parents and like what they see in their children. 
The other thing are, are conversations with teachers. But one of the things that did come back after assessing reading scores across the students that were in our program and across the grades at our school, um, and we don't, we're not to the point where we can conclusively say at this point that Sloyd is the reason for any of these outcomes, but the second graders have continuously shown higher um, achievement in uh, their reading, the, the growth that they've had, the delta that they've had has been statistically significant compared to other grades. So those are things that we're starting to notice that, oh, the, the trickle over effect and the teachers have noticed that they're not, like the children are more willing to take risks in the classroom. Those mm. risks being, I'll try that harder math equation or I'll try reading that word on my own and not, not crumple up and not, you know, throw a fit and quit because it's too hard. Mm. So we think that we're on track to, to finding some of those things, but how to, there's no controlled experiments that we have at this point. Right. It's anecdotal. Um, and that's where we've tried to figure out if those data points are things like in Finland and Sweden that we could get to them present because they've been doing it for so long. But they're like, no, we just, this is part of it. This is, you don't know that. We just do it. <laughs> yes. But if there's interest in uh, that collaboration, um, please reach out on uh, our website. You can get to us through that contact portal there. And we, we love to have those, those mm -hmm. conversations. Um, I just want to shout out what you just mentioned, which is another incredible uh, sort of um, result of this type of work is confidence in young kids. Huge. Mm. Um, for the so, two of you, for the two of you, what, was it more difficult for you to learn the woodworking aspect of Sloyd or the teaching? For me, it was the teaching. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm a microbiologist by by trade, so. <laughs> You, you know, you, you have a com complete career change. I mean, but they're both challenging. But for me, it was most certainly like becoming an educator because I wasn't a trained educator. My last um, job with the Air Force, I was teaching ROTC at the University of Colorado Boulder. And so I had gone through some formal education training um, in order to become an instructor. Uh, it's a little bit different to work with college age students than elementary, but not much at the same time. <laughs> um, so I, I've always really had a passion for working with people and, and teaching in general, albeit I'm not a, a, a trained teacher. And that really is one of the interesting things about Sloyd in general, even from the historical perspective, is that they sought teachers and educators first to teach them woodworking rather than finding craftsmen to teach them how to work with children because the latter mm -hmm. is, is more difficult. Knowing how to work with children is paramount. Knowing how to empathize with them, knowing how to talk to them, knowing how to relate to them, um, knowing how to like be fun and silly in the classroom but still command respect. Um, that's yes. that's the most important part. Um, two other questions that are sort of tied in together. One is, are your Sloyd models available for sale or download? I think there's a lot of people that would like you two to franchise. <laughs> and not the yet. second, not yet. Okay. Not yet. Correct. Okay. Um, and then another question about, can you talk about fundraising for this important um, nonprofit organization and its mission? Can you say that one more time? Um, just... Tell us about your fund and how are you fundraising? What's that process for you all for this important mission? Absolutely. So all the majority of our funding to this point has been in-kind donations. We haven't been incredibly successful in a grant perspective. We're still working on writing grants. We aren't explicitly STEM. We aren't explicitly the arts. It, like trying to find that niche organization, but we have been really blessed with, I mean, when we talked about before, everyone understands the why, like this is important. So people want to help fund it. So if I tell someone my story, I, we've had opportunities where families have gifted us $20,000. We've had families that gift $5 a month. We have, you know, like, so it's, it's a very in-kind fundraising uh, portion. We have people giving in our community and we have people giving across the globe. So it it is a, a community grassroots effort that has made us successful for these last five years and built us up to where we're at now. Mm -hmm. So 
It is um, as an like we are a nonprofit. So if this mission resonates with you and you feel compelled to help move it along, giving and donating is the best way to help us take those steps in the next direction. So we don't have to say we don't have an instructor training program yet, or we are only in one school. We can say we're in 10 schools, but we have to pay for those instructors and uh, pay for that training and that building and the equipment to house it. But that instructor, that person that will physically teach is the most important part, but we're, we're, at, we're always fundraising. We're always uh, doing our best to communicate the importance of this so that we can, can keep it going. And well, you have, I, yeah. here, here's an opportunity for us to say thank you to, yeah. to all of those supporters and whether you've supported financially or emotionally for us to encourage us along the way, there's no way that Allison and I could have done and continue to do what we do without the support of the community at large. And I'm not talking about just Louisville, Colorado. Um, it, it goes so far beyond that, including mm -hmm. North Bennett, yeah. right? North Bennett Street. This communication here um, is is so rich, so meaningful, so impactful for, for us. So thank you. For us as well. And you have so many fans here and in this uh, program this evening and just keep on doing what you're doing. It's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. It's been great having you. Um, we have some people saying congratulations on your good work. Keep, keep up that amazing work. Um, thank you all for being with us this evening and Luke and Allison. I love talking with you. And awesome. Matt, so Same to you. Thanks so yeah. much for the conversation. Yep. Lovely. Yep. Thank you. And everybody take care. Have a great night and we'll see you soon. All right. All right. Take care.